A person that's successful is a person that has a sense of their, the reason they're alive and what their, what their direction is in life. And that they're pursuing that direction in a way that is comfortable and morally correct for themselves. That real success comes from feeling, from your, your inner heartfelt feeling that what you're doing with your life, that who you are, how you think, what you do with your time is fulfilling for yourself, is com completely, that it completely gives you a sense that you're making the most of the gift of time here in this life. And to me, success is a person that feels that they are truly doing what they are born to do, whatever that might be. And if they don't have that feeling that they're searching, that they're constantly searching for what that is for themselves. What, why are you here? that they're, they're questioning, they're asking that question, and that they're searching for the answer. And in that search, they are hoping to find their, what they truly inner, in, the, what they truly feel inside themselves. It doesn't matter what people tell you, it doesn't matter how many awards you've won, it doesn't matter what other people say, oh, how wonderful you are, how great you are. If you don't feel it for yourself, then it doesn't mean anything. There are many people who have been awarded many, many, many awards in their lives, and yet they commit suicide. Why? Because they don't feel they des deserve it in themselves. You have to feel that you deserve, do you deserve fulfillment based on your own, your own set of requirements for yourself? Because others can't give you those, that set. Others can't make you feel valuable. You have to feel your own sense of worth. And to me, that's the truth of success. If you don't feel it for yourself deep in your heart, then you are not successful, no matter what anybody else tells you. I feel like I still have a long way to go, that I'm searching. I'm searching, that I'm wanting to, to do much more, um, that I want to search for the answers to many different things, and that I am nowhere near the success that I feel that I feel content, that I would feel content about. I am no, no, I'm not content with myself at all. You know, I, I might have won awards in, in athletics and in design and things, but no, I have not even touched on the, the capacity that I have to do what I am capable of doing. So, no, I am nowhere near success in my own sense of myself. Uh, I, I, have not, I have not arrived at that success. I encourage it in others. I always encourage other people to... Do whatever you can to, to seek, to search for yourself, to search for your real passion, what you're, what you're here to do. You know, why are you here? Why are you alive? And I ask myself the same question. You know, why am I here? And so I know I have these abilities, and I'm, I have, but I have not fulfilled those abilities at all. And so I am seeking to, to make that fulfillment, to reach for my own contentment in myself. And so when you say, when you ask if I'm successful, oh, no, no, I'm far from it. And so I, I want to move in that direction and be successful to try to find out what will fulfill my own sense of success. The, the main step is to search. You have to search, ask yourself, is this what I really want to do? Is this what really makes me feel good about myself, makes me feel valuable? It's all about self-value. And so, uh, and that means physical self. I mean, I mean, we should all be at the epitome of our physical abilities, we, uh, our physical looks, our strength, our, our, our body weight, all that is part of it. 
Um, that's a part of it. And also our mental capacity, our, our, our creative capacity. Have, have we fulfilled our creative capacity? For me, no. Not, not in the least. I could do so much more. You know, I, could, I could design a radically different building every day if I were asked to. You know, I, I feel like I could do that. I, could, uh, uh, I have ideas about music. That, that I think would, would revolutionize music. I like to, I like to make trouble for, for what we think things are, like, like design, uh, music, athletics. You know, I, I like to, to stir things up. I, I think, no, I can think of something better than that. And so I haven't reached those things that, uh, I haven't reached those, those goals that, uh, that I want, would love to see in so many different things. So, yeah, so, that, that's, so it's the searching that I think is um, where, what, what I'm doing, what I think everyone should be doing. We should be searching for what gives our life meaning, what gives our sense of that, that we've fulfilled our own capacity for creativity and originality. That's important. I think there's much more to it than just being creative. You have to, you have to push yourself to be original. You have to originate new ideas, new possibilities. And that doesn't, I don't mean just thinking about it. I mean making things happen. I mean, uh, athletically, you know, it takes a lot of suffering to do that. I, I think that's one, one aspect that people don't often talk about is that, um, you know, the word passion comes from the capacity to suffer. It's very interesting. Passion is about suffering. And so when you... Are really start to pursue what you're passionate about, you're willing to suffer, whatever it takes. You know, I'm going to arrive at, at what uh, my ideas, my goals, and I don't care how much I have to suffer for it, I'll, I'm just going to do it. So that's, that's how you know you're on the right, the right road. You know when you're really successful because it's never been done before. I think there's something about that is, that is never been considered, that true success happens when you're doing something that has never been considered before and then you know you're you're on the right track because you've originated something new you've 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 contributed a poem to life you contributed something to the consciousness of possibility and when, once you and then oftentimes that makes the impossible you're making the impossible possible and that's when you know that you're, you're doing something significant. Well, it's interesting because when I designed this building, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a, a real search, and it was a, a solution to many problems that I was given by, by my parents and other people, and, and the environment itself. But the actual making of it and the result is kind of anticlimactic because you already thought about it. So it's, it's really the, it's the process of conception that's really the, the, the time when, when you're, you're creating something that seems to be impossible and making it possible. Once you start to draw it all out and think about it and work out the details, then it's almost, for me, it's almost a kind of anticlimactical process because you've already thought about it. You know what it's going to look like when you, when you finish. And I think every good design person or every person that has good vision of what they're doing can, can understand this because the, that it, the conception is the, 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 the most empowering part of, of creation. So the, the concept is all about the concept, the power of the concept, the quality of the concept. It is not so much the result in, in, in the three-dimensional realm. And so this is, I, I love it, but it makes me want to think about the next one. What's the next one going to be? How far can I take this idea? That's, that's where, where the real attraction comes. You know, okay, so you're going to make a, a house that's impossible to be destroyed by natural disaster. Okay, what would be the next level to go to? This, this, is the, this was the beginning. Now, where, with these new materials, new processes of construction, 
where can you go next? And that's what, that's what, that's what this house reminds me to think of. That's the irony of it, that you that you are you're trying to grab grasp for this this making the impossible possible, and then when that becomes possible, you, you you've already thought of it. So it's, it was just a matter of making that thing happen, um, and it's it's the irony, it's the paradox of life, is that we always look for the greener pastures, and when we arrive. We think, oh man, you know, I really remember those days when I was struggling and it was so much fun to be a part of that struggle. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we should revert to those days and that we should all just be in pain in the struggle. But I, I'm saying that, there, that once, you dream, once you dream of the concept, that really is the most, the most attractive part of the whole process because it takes you have to fail to succeed you know you you try 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 and so failure is a part of success and when you reach the success then you want to keep going you know success is not enough and maybe that's a that's a, a maybe that's not such a great part of being human because we're not so easily satisfied and and i i think about that myself i think about well if you're constantly achieving something or, or reaching for something that's impossible and you arrive at that impossibility and it doesn't really it's not really fulfilling because it was the it was, just, it was the concept that mattered then where where do you end up so i'm i think that maybe it's just the process after all that's the process of, of striving to achieve the pains that you took. And maybe that is what you learn. That is what you retain. It's the, the, the challenge, the, the, the struggle and the challenge of whatever it is you're pursuing that actually becomes the learning lesson that is most valuable. Animals exist and they, and they love and they give birth to newborns and they... they have a fulfillment. I, I think all animals have a fulfillment, and they deserve that right to to be that way. Because as we are independent human beings, I think every animal on the planet, every living thing, has a deserved right to live their life in 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 being fulfilled in themselves. That we we as human beings have no right to dominate and to control the lives of other living beings. And that, to me, is a very, very morally, morally disconcerting aspect of, of living that I'm finding out, is that the domination that we have as human beings to other animals, to other living things on the planet, is wrong, is absolutely wrong. Because just as we deserve to be free human beings, to, to find our purpose in life, to, to find our own fulfillment, so every living thing deserves that right. And we have, no, we, we have no right to keep those living things, whether it's an insect, an animal, a bird, a fish, to, we have no right to destroy those animals because of our own consumption patterns, our own habits. We have no right to do that. Um, and we should, we should think of ways to... to have as a little possible uh, as little possible consumptive footprint on the planet and and to do as little harm and to cause inflict as little pain as possible to all living things and to me that 's also a part of feel, feeling fulfilled that that moral sense of not harming of do, you know, of, of, of doing more with less is absolutely a, a problem that we need to find solutions to for ourselves. I think animals do strive to succeed. They strive to succeed to, to love each other, to, to um, grow their, their infants, to, to propagate, um, to live in a society. Every animal has a society, whether it's an insect, a fish, whatever it might be and to be a part of a, a larger social body and and we should 
find ways to do that for ourselves without harming those other groups of, of social beings. Because I think what we're doing is we are creating a great harm and disservice to other, other living beings and we are interrupting the whole chain of, of natural process of life for many, many sentient beings on the planet. Well, my family and my children, grandchildren and, and wife and, and uh, uh, siblings that, well actually I don't have any siblings, my relatives uh, are 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 part of they're they're part of my sense of fulfillment but they're only a part of it they're not they're not the whole my whole scope of fulfillment and so uh we all have to and myself we all have to come to that point where we really truly feel in our heart that we are content with our lives with our relationships and i do not feel content with my relationships so and, and and it's because my relationship is to a much uh, to to the earth as a whole and and my family my immediate family is only a small part of that that greater relationship and so i'm trying to find the answer to what is my proper relationship to this much larger living being this much larger earth uh, earth organism. Well, see, when I see other people, other beings, human beings harming uh, animals and other human beings, that that's hurtful. That that's painful, and, I, and it makes me wonder. It poses a question to me: how how do we help one another not hurt other beings? And in architecture, I, I'm trying to make architecture to do that too. Like architecture is one of the most destructive activities on the planet. 45% of the world's pollution comes from architecture. It comes from the making of steel and concrete and glass. It comes from the operation of buildings, which is incredibly polluting. Uh, you know, a typical commercial building might, might, might uh, inject 10, 10 tons of polluting toxicity into the into the atmosphere a day a typical bu commercial building will do that uh, and that that's you know that's killing us so so i'm wondering okay so as an architect what can i do about architecture that doesn't harm people and that's one of my one of my uh problems one of the problems i'm trying to surmount is what's the answer and this building was the beginning of that this building needs no heating, air conditioning, ventilation. It, it, it lets nature do it for it by itself. And so I'm trying to enlarge on this and create other buildings that, that uh, react to nature the same way this building does. This was the first. And so now, for instance, the, the underground conference center in Mount Shasta would be the current solution. Uh, creating a gigantic 40,000 square foot building, actually a series of buildings, that's underground, that's a part of nature. And I love that concept because we think of buildings as, as things to implant in the earth instead of the building being the earth itself. And so in Mount Shasta, this building is nature. It's a part of nature and we are... We are, we are in the lap of nature then in this underground building. And so it's, it's defying the whole paradigm of what architecture has been in history. And that's where we need to go. We need to defy, we need to have the strength to defy everything that we've assumed anything to be. Whether it's sports, music, architecture, science. We should defy our assumptions. And then I think that's the key to originality to create creating solutions to real problems yes it is it is because I in my research I found out that about 10,000 years ago all the built many all the buildings I could discover were round circular and and circles in curvilinear forms have in their in their geometry a kind of equal equality 
that there's no head, there's no, there's no corner to have the leader and the peons, you know, the followers and the leader, that in a circle, in a curving form, everyone is equal. And so that's why uh, uh, societies that are from circular, curvilinear uh, city plans and villages, like the, the Kogi people of, of the highest mountains of and the Andes, like the American Indian tribes, like certain tribes in Africa. Um, uh, many indigenous tribes have this form, that they're circular oriented, that, they're, that they're, there's a kind of uh, equi, equilateral sense of, of uh, that everyone has a say. In, it's, it's a kind of communal decision making. And, and now we've, we've come to uh, forms which are, which are sharp angles, which are rectilinear, straight line, and everything is measured out. And that measurement system is a kind of domination of nature. It's, it's putting nature into calculable uh, geometries, and that's not nature. Uh, it's not the universe. It's not how the universe works. It's not uh, the forms, and all the forms in nature, all the living organisms are curvilinear. And there's a reason for that because curvilinear forms are using the least amount of materials with the maximum structural strength. Every 3D form is like that, a bird's nest, a, a, a bee's nest, uh, whatever it might be, a burrow of a, co a coyote burrow in the ground. They're, they're all curving and they're all using the temperature and the humidity and the air in beautiful, strong, lightweight, efficient ways. But we've lost that. We've lost that knowledge. And so we build these very heavy, megalithic, monolithic buildings that are very wasteful, that are very energy intensive, and we're killing ourselves because these buildings contribute to uh, d the destruction of the planet, which we're now seeing in terms of fires, in earthquakes, in um, sea level rising, in the acidity of the ocean, in the plastics everywhere, in every living thing. All of these things we've created because of this, this paradigm of domination and measurement imposed on nature. On this planet. That's right. Yeah, you know, it took billions of years to arrive at this beautiful curvilinear, um, should we say, alien form. But that form is not alien. It's only alien to us because we've been so far removed from nature that that anything natural that's that's you know that's taken three and a half billion years to design and and make it seems foreign, seems alien, and and that shows how far we've come from from the natural intelligence and beauty of nature you know we we are the aliens we've become alienated from nature and so we have to return to this primal intelligence to this very deep and profound intelligence that's taken three and a half billion years to create um, but unfortunately most of us are not doing that we're just following, uh, following our own pattern and our own conditioning in our education system of domination and control and, and belief that, that we are the supreme beings of the, of the universe and everything else is, is secondary to us. And that, that egotistical selfishness, that, that arrogance is what, is what is destroying our future.